Good evening. I'd like to declare the meeting open at one minute past six and I'd like to start by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, apologies and members on leave of absence. We do have an apology from Councillor Harley currently overseas and we also have an apology from Councillor Fatakas who is unwell. Um, so that takes us to public question time. I haven't seen an audience this large in some time, so it's great to see you all here tonight. Um, I would say that with public question time, we do allow everyone to speak, but we do time you to three minutes. And as we have such a big crowd here this evening, I will have to call you to time at the three minute mark. Uh, David, the CEO, will have his timer going. So when you hear the bell, um, please do um, allow the next person to come forward. We just do ask that when you come to the microphone, there is no set order, but please state your name, the suburb in which you live and the item that you're speaking to this evening. And also just all comments, if they could just remain um, to the actual item, the planning item matters, if they are planning items and um, not of a personal nature. So I'll call forward the first speaker. Attended tonight, this has been an incredibly big turn out to this council meeting. Um, I have found that we have 20, approximately 20 students here from the Curtin University Planning um, who've come to see planning decision making in action, so they've chosen a good night to come along. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for being here and thanks to all of the um, people um, from the music industry and the musicians who've travelled far and wide this evening to visit Vincent, which we do think is the best place in Perth to, to live and work and listen to music. Um, so I will just um, deal with... Uh, applications for leave of absence and then we will come to the two deputations this evening. So I'll just check, CO, do we have any requests? We have none, so we can go straight to um, receiving deputations. Um, the two that I have, we did have three, but Mary has opted to speak more briefly during public question time, so I'll move to Rebecca Proposy to speak on um, 9.5. Uh, sorry, confirmation of minutes. We have the minutes dated... Sorry, close the iPad so I could watch the video. If you'll just bear with me for a second. Docs on tap is reloading. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Loden. The confirmation of the minutes for the 17th of September. Could I please have a mover and second? I move Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. Um, announcements by the presiding member. I do have some important announcements to make this evening, so if you wouldn't mind bearing with me while I work through those, and we will then get to the items before us this evening. But it would be remiss of me to not make some comments about one of our council members who is uh, joining us in the chamber for the last time this evening, and that is Councillor Jimmy Murphy known to some as the festival guy, but around here we know him as much more than that. Um, tonight we just really want to say thank you to Jimmy and we wish you all the best on your continued journey and your evolution with the town team movement ahead. Um, I think it's really impressive to, when you think about the fact that the town team movement is actually really based on the first um, commitment that Jimmy Murphy made as a candidate in a Vote for Pedro inspired t-shirt. Um, to establish a Vincent Foundation using philanthropic I knew I'd stick, I told you I wouldn't get that out. Philanthropic funds to support community and arts in Vincent. Um, so not only has Jimmy followed through on that commitment, he's really taken it to the next level with the town team movement and taking that movement, which did start here in the city of Vincent, which we're incredibly proud of, and it is close to our hearts, taking that out to not just the rest of WA, but internationally, we hear, and certainly nationally. So we wish you all the very best with that, Jimmy. Um, we do note that you are a councillor with a difference, that you are a bit of an antidote to the government bureaucrat. You're not afraid to start something, and you don't see barriers, you just see the potential. You definitely have a can-do approach. You don't, and I think this is a quote from yourself, don't wait for somebody else to do something, make it happen. Faith in people, faith in the importance of connection. You see the positive and potential in everyone and you give everyone an open invitation to participate. 
You are a connector and celebrator of people and place and you're expert at bringing those two together. You have a genuine love and care for the arts through your lived experience and you can pull a room of people together with your warm and welcoming ways and sense that you create of being some part of something bigger than themselves. Everyone knows Jimmy. So some shining moments in Jimmy's four years on council. Well, Jimmy has really led the most impressive arts advisory group. On this group, they have single-handedly developed the arts development plan, not a consultant in sight, I'm so proud to say. Um, we have a major artwork underway in the city of Vincent, and you have led that arts army with passion and direction and with results. You've been absolutely critical to supporting the town teams in the city of Vincent, all of them, but with a bit of a special place in your heart for Leaderville Connect and the Pickle District. Um, you have a great love of our town centres and you've got your eye on the next frontier, the social and cultural enterprise. You've been a huge supporter of getting Leaderville Village Square off the ground and making that happen and you're a huge advocate for making better use of our places to make them accessible, contemporary, affordable, for us as a small inner city government, local government, and influenced by the people who inhabit them. You've been a supporter of greater sustainability in Vincent. You've sat on through, much to your credit, the Tamala Park Regional Council. Thank you for deputising for me. So much appreciation. Remember, I've booked you in for Thursday night. And also the Business Advisory Group. We also had a very special um, rendition of the last post and the Revel at Anzac Day this year when Jimmy took his hat off and played at our Anzac Day ceremony in Axford Park. I did ask a couple of key people in your life, in your town team life, to make a few comments, Jimmy. David Galloway couldn't wait to say a few comments. David Galloway is a long-time member of Leadville Connect and he says, Jimmy is one of the most selfless people I have met with a huge passion and big vision for changing the world. He balances this passion and vision with a pragmatism that is able to roll with what arrives and while still seeing the opportunities that are emerging from a challenging circumstance. In Jimmy's case, it's the strength of his vision for creating the greater good that enables him to interact with many different people, get them to support the creation of a better world. This also appears to make him largely immune to being co-opted into other people's self-interested dreams and schemes. He says, as I said, Emma Cole, in local government, Jimmy is high risk and high return. <laughs> but we haven't had any breaches, I might just add there. <laughs> Jimmy is also fun, and in this age of social media-driven self-obsession, it is really nice to be able to hang out with a bloke who fundamentally appreciates a good beer, loud music, and going sick on the dance floor. <laughs> I also asked the Pickle District, and they say that meeting Jimmy was like a breath of fresh air and very surprising. As new kids on the block, I guess we expected more scepticism, but he made us feel extremely welcome and valued. His approach to our group had the confidence to, gave us the confidence to open up possibilities and treat our ideas as viable. I guess he sort of removed the sense of obstacles like a navigator. Anyhow, he's a great people person. As far as art goes, he just gets it. So, Jimmy, personally, um, I'd just like to say that I have immensely enjoyed working with you and I feel I've been really lucky to have your tremendous support as Mayor. And just to say, I think it's been really inspirational. It's been a lot of fun. We've generated creative change and greater community connection with your help. And I just want to say from all of us, thank you for doing local government differently. But wait, there's more. We also have Councillor Harley leaving us. She's actually on an overseas adventure at the moment, but I'll, I will say some comments. I'll be a bit brief, given that Ros isn't here. But I just want to acknowledge that Ros is leaving Council after eight years. Um, she joined us in October 2011 and was Deputy Mayor from 2013 to 2017. Some of the words I'd use to describe Ros, passionate, eloquent, intelligent, determined, expressive strong on governance, someone who really understands the Local Government Act and the importance of good policy.
Roz has been deeply passionate about reconciliation in Aboriginal and Noongar culture, and during her time on council, we've achieved our first and second reconciliation action plans. Um, Roz has a deep love of the celebration of Vincent's multicultural heritage and also loves being part of the Vincent dog community. She was a great advocate for more off-leash dog exercise areas in Vincent and Jack Marks Park becoming the first fully fenced dog exercise park. Um, she's very into the garden competition and greening and told me that every time she walks or drives down Oxford Street, seeing the trees planted in the median strips um, really brings her great joy, something that happened under her tenure. She has a keen eye on expenditure and would always scrutinise the expenditure report, raising again and again the cost of newspapers, flowers and the Crimea market. Hashtag shop local was the message there. Leadership and support. I think that when we look back at when Roz joined council, there was a really key piece happening around transparency, accountability and cultural change at Vincent and in the local government sector. Roz bore a lot of the stress and responsibility at that time alongside former Mayor John Kerry. I did call John and ask him for a comment and John Kerry, now member for Perth, said that Ros Harley was an outstanding Deputy Mayor, the right leadership needed at a critical time at the City of Vincent. She was a key driver of reform on transparency and accountability. I couldn't have done the job without her, said John. I do remember when John Carey and Ros, then Mayor and Deputy Mayor, took up transpar transparency reform at the Welga AGM, I think it was 2014 or 15. They were effectively booed out of the room by Welga. But we are now seeing many of the measures that they championed being implemented through the Local Government Act reform. Things like mandatory training for council members, greater transparency with information held by local governments being required to be put online, and minimum standards around the recruitment selection and performance of CEOs. So it did bear fruit. More recently, I'd just like to acknowledge that Ros was an excellent contrib contributor on the CEO recruitment panel in helping us select David as our not quite new anymore CEO. So I'd just like to wish Ros well for the future on behalf of all of us here at Team Vincent, and we hope she's enjoying her current travels across the globe. Finally, I just want to say to Susan Gontoshevsky, um, thank you so much, Susan, for being an outstanding Deputy Mayor for the past two years. You have just been an incredible um, support and um, uh, advisor along the way. Um, this is not a farewell speech. I just wanted to say thank you for being an outstanding Deputy Mayor and we wish you and all candidates all the best for Saturday's South Ward election. Um, for any um, South Ward residents tuning in, um, we will have the administration open until 6pm on election day, which is this Saturday, the 19th of October, and you can vote um, up to 6pm. Uh, um, it's best if you could please bring in your election packages if you have lost it or the dog has eaten it. Our staff are trained to um, provide additional, um, sorry, replacement ballot papers. So that concludes um, the announcements. Unless, Jimmy Murphy, do you wish to say anything? I should have asked if you'd like a right of reply. Uh, maybe I'll just say a couple of quick things. Um, thank you. That was very generous uh, comments, and I've really loved uh, my four years here at this council. I think this is a wonderful council, um, forward-thinking, progressive, um, beautiful demonstration of political leadership where perhaps that's lacking in the world and various other places. Um, I do also want to just say for the record uh, the town team movement that has been um, created from Vincent is a product of all you guys, this council in particular, the staff. Our former mayor created the first town team, uh, John Carey, uh, David Doy, uh, our first place manager coined the term town team. Um, this, uh, our town teams, uh, residents and businesses coming together um, in a unique fashion to uh, really have a voice and it's beyond an advisory group, it's actually an empowered platform of real citizen um, engagement and empowerment, which I just think is uh, an incredible, uh, well, it's basically, as far as I'm concerned, revolutionising or the potential to revolutionise the way local government interacts with its community, and it started here. Um, yeah, the town team movement, 
we've started, and ironically is the main reason why I'm not um, going to be running again, uh, because uh, it's just got so popular and so big. We've got 40 town teams now um, across Australia. Uh, we're going about to have our first town team start in New Zealand, and um, I'm on a flight to Canberra tomorrow uh, to help our, our town team in Dixon in Canberra do their first busking festival. Um, so it's pretty amazing uh huge impact a potential impact from the model vincent's model and so i just want to say for the record that um very will very clearly uh and and stay true to the fact that and uh honor the fact that that this model is from vincent from this progressive council and um yeah i just wanted to make that point but just think everyone's been quite um quite an awesome experience and anyone who wants to go for council uh, or even thought about it i would encourage you to do it it's an amazing uh experience personal growth um and uh, i feel like uh i've done my constituents proud i feel like i've followed through with most of my promises uh made and it uh, it's a very satisfying feeling so thank you very much thank you so much jimmy All right, we shall move on to declarations of interest. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we've received two declarations of interest from Councillor Murphy, uh, the first in relation to item 9.3. Uh, Councillor Murphy is friends with Tracy Frawley, uh, who would be intending to manage the um, short-term accommodation property if it was approved by Council. Uh, the second item is a disclosure, a, um, a financial disclosure of interest from Councillor Murphy in relation to item 11.4, authorisation of expenditure, uh, the association uh, being the town team movement receiving sponsorship from the city uh, for its recent annual conference. And Councillor Murphy is confirming that he is currently a part-time employee and director of the town team movement. Thank you, CEO. Um, so I'll now go around the room to see whether council members wish to draw forward any items other than those that have already been raised by members of the public gallery this evening. Um, Councillor Hallett, do you have anything to add to the list? No, but could someone just open the door around there? Open the door? We're going to open the door. Okay, sure. Councillor Castle, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Tobelberg, Councillor... Konshevsky, I have nothing further. Um, so the, we'll just um, read out the items that will be moved on block. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll read out the item numbers which would be proposed to be moved on block by Council, which would include items 9 9.6, 9.7, 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.5, 12.1, 12.2, 12.3, and 12.4. Thank you, CEO. Could I please have a mover and seconder for the on-block items? Move Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I declare the on-block items carried. Um, for the benefit of members of the public gallery, the way that we then deal with the remainder of the items, um, we go through the order in which they were raised by members of the public gallery. So that order is going to be 9.3, 9.4, 9.1, 9.5, 9.2 and 11.4, which has been brought out because there's a financial interest on that one. So I'll now go to item 9.3, which is number two, Brookman Street, Perth, change of use from single house to unlisted use, short-term dwelling and single house. Councillors, can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved, Councillor Lowden. 
Seconded, Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do note there's um, two, um, one alternative recommendation and um, a proposed alternative, um, which I'll uh, let others have a look at and think about. Um, this is this is an interesting one because not far around the corner we've had um, a refusal, uh, which went all the way to SAT and was was um, approved. Like they agreed with our refusal of that application. The distinction here with this development is the the fact that it neighbours right onto um, the commercial commercial zone. So it, rather than it being completely surrounded by a residential area um, on two 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 thirds of the sides, you have commercial developments. But that doesn't change the fact that it is a residential area as well, sitting there right in the corner. So it's it is very challenging because it's a question of of. I guess scope creep. Do you then see that this is approved and then it cascades down there? Um, I am also aware that there has been discussions with the applicant around the um, the time frame of that approval. The current proposal is for um, six months of the year, but the uh, applicant is amenable to a, uh, a shorter time restriction on that as well. I just wanted to clarify that with um, the with uh, through the mayor to the the manager. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that is correct. Um, ultimately, what was proposed uh, as part of the application was up to 50% of the year, being up to six months. Um, but subsequently, and late in the piece, following the briefing session, um, the applicant advised that they are agreeable to a term of up to 10 weeks in a 12-month period. And on the topic of the 10 weeks, how would the city enforce that? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, ultimately uh, there is a condition around the terms of the approval, one of which is that uh, the applicant is required to notify the city uh, every three months once the use commences uh, with demonstrating and confirming the, the dates that the, uh, the premise has been used for that purpose. Um, that would also include any third party platforms or online booking systems um, to be provided to the city. And how would the city verify if that was... So, for example, they declared that there were certain days that it was used um, and then it was used on other days as well. How would the city know if they were not holding their end of the bargain? Through you, Mayor Cole, ultimately it is a compliance um, matter and the city would need to undertake the investigation that I set out um, uh, and the onus is on the applicant to confirm those dates. The city can go so far as to um, to confirming uh, those dates of of the use um, operating on site, but uh, ultimately that is reliant on the applicant confirming those details. Would it be fair to say that um, the neighbouring properties um, would be able to, if they felt that it was not, if it was exceeding the dates, they could then lodge a complaint about that, and that would then be followed up by the city. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, on that assumption, that would only be on the basis that uh, presumably there would be an issue um, with the with the premises um, uh, being conducted in a certain way that was generating offside impacts. Uh, only then would presumably the city be notified. So, I mean, in, in my mind, six months is, is too significant impact. The redu reduction in time that is proposed in one of the amendments, on balance, I'm comfortable with that, but I am going to be intrigued what other councillors have to say about that as well, um, because this is, um, I guess, what I would see as a slippery slope as well that uh, could um, cause further problems in the future. Councillor Hallett. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, just wondering if um, administration can clarify the progress so far of developing short-term accommodation policy um, frameworks for the city. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the city has completed a desktop review of the existing short-term accommodation policy um, to understand how the current provisions are, are working. Um, we've also reviewed the short-term accommodation planning frameworks of other areas, um, both within WA and um, elsewhere in the world, to understand how 
um, these types of uses can be um, accommodated and, and managed in other areas of the world. Um, on the 26th of September, the parliamentary inquiry into short stay accommodation was released. So the team is currently going through that, uh, the results of that inquiry in detail and putting together a number of options for um, how the city may want to proceed in relation to short-term accommodation through a number of planning mechanisms, I would anticipate that we would be able to provide an update to council members um, before the end of the year on a number of options and then um, report to council with a, um, for a decision or consideration early next year. Um, what would be the um, potential implications if we were to defer this until we've gotten more um, formal approved policies in this space? Do you remember, um, ultimately uh, that would be available to Council to defer an item. I guess administration's response would be that uh, under the planning regulations, when an application is submitted, um, there's a number of things that you can do. Deferral is not one of those listed items. Um, you can approve, approve subject to conditions and also refuse. So uh, based on the current planning framework, I, my recommendation is to determine the appropriateness of this proposal on its own merits um, against the current planning framework um, because that's ultimately what's been applied for. Sorry, and just to confirm that if it was deferred, um, that would go out of the statutory timeline and that it could be appealed to SAT as a deemed to refuse? Through Mayor Cole, that's correct. Um, could you also maybe comment on the role of um, that that little precinct being a heritage listed area and what implication that has for um, such a use in terms of impact on um, the actual infrastructure? Through Mayor Cole, um, the application is purely for a change of use for a period of time throughout the year. It doesn't relate to any physical works. Um, the guideline or the policy that you're referring to for Brookman and, and Moyer uh, ultimately relates to um, physical alterations and, and development as opposed to any reference to the social impacts. So on that basis, and that was established in the recent SAT decision that was, um, that's been referred to for Eight Moyer, uh, ultimately the social impact or that consideration um, is not relevant, I guess, for the purposes of determining a, a change of use or a use proposal. I mean, from your perspective, what is the relevance of that SAT um, decision in relation to this particular application? Through Mayor Cole, um, the relevance of that decision really uh, highlights the importance of site context um, when considering particularly a uh, non-residential proposal in a residential setting. Uh, very different site context as alluded to previously by Councillor Loden. Um, in that uh, previous decision, it was mid-block um, along Moyer Street, um, directly ad adjoining residential properties. Uh, Ultimately, the, the distinction here that needs to be made is that this particular site is on a corner block um, directly adjacent to a car yard and the back of offices, uh, restaurants and, and cafes, uh, and in itself um, fronts onto traffic generated from those types of uses. So already the amenity impact um, is there and existent. Um, also, it's noted that the outdoor living area of this particular property is located towards the street front and not towards the adjoining residential property that this site abuts. So site context, really important, and uh, potential impact on adjoining residential properties, and the extent of that was critical and established in that previous SAT decision. Thanks. And just in relation to that outdoor living area, there was a comment from the public gallery in relation to um, potential capacity for up to 50 people having a party, et cetera, in the um, pool. Um, under the code of conduct in the management plan, um, it does refer to a maximum number of overnight guests of four people and that the property is not to be used by guests to host parties or other social events. Uh, you referred to, I guess, some of the possible challenges in compliance monitoring, um, but could you maybe comment on how we can ensure that that um, is met? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, ultimately the acceptability of the proposal um, is largely reliant on compliance with that management plan. Ultimately, uh, the city's officers would be um, 
uh, able to respond to any concerns that are raised with respect to any uh, perceived non-compliance um, with the terms of that approval. Ultimately, then the city would investigate and either validate or um, or not uh, that alleged non-compliance. Now, um, that as part of that management plan, you are right, it's been limited to a number of four occupants, um, and that applies irrespective of whether it's within the dwelling itself or in the pool area. So uh, s the city uh, administration is satisfied that the management plan is um, adequate uh, to ensure that the particular use proposed will not um, detrimentally impact the adjoining properties. I might let other people comment for a bit. Councillors? Councillor Murphy? <clears throat> yeah, look, I, um, I hear what uh, Councillor Loden's talking about in terms of um, a slippery slope. I think it's good to hear that there will be a um, some sort of policy presented early next year to deal with this. I think that um, the concerns from the gallery are completely valid in the sense that, you know, most community members want to have, uh, you know, permanent residents or, or renters who are in the community, can, interacting with the community, part of the community, um, uh, and they don't want to see a residential home used essentially as a hotel for fly-by-night guests. Um, absolutely get that. But I also do get that a homeowner who wishes to go on holidays for six weeks of the year, does also have the liberty and the uh, right, in my view, to be able to, to have guests um, come and stay in that home uh, and and that be remunerated for that, um, which I believe was the original intent of Airbnb, and I think it's probably, um, uh, for want of a better word, taking the piss now, but I think the original idea was for that very I'll need. I'll allow that comment, <laughs> given it's your last meeting, Councillor Murphy. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, um, so I would uh, actually support the amendment um, and thank the um, Jay for for doing this, um, and I'll foreshadow that the uh, not the not the um, alternate. I would actually um, support the amendment. I'm not sure if anyone has any other comments. Otherwise, I'm happy to move it. Are you moving the amendment, Councillor Murphy? Yes, I'll move the amendment. Okay. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Oh, it's a show of hands, Councillor Castle. <laughs> Um, well, I think I've said my bid, actually, so I'll leave it okay, at that. Okay, over to you, Castle Councillor there. Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes. I, I'm supportive of this amendment as written. I think it does strike a balance between w what we currently have in the city, which is uncertainty about how we wish to proceed with short-term <coughs> accommodation. Um, obviously, in the absence of that policy or a, a reviewed policy, it's very hard to form... Um, a permanent view on how these types of applications should be dealt with. Um, but I do think that uh, given the recent SAP decision and given the extra uh, restrictions that this amendment brings, um, that this actually gives uh, a longer period of time when this property will be used as residential. Ten weeks of the year is not going, I don't think, in my view, going to have um, a substantial impact on the community. Um, and I think it also gives us a way to uh, to test how this might play out in this particular uh, location. So um, for me, what's important in this amendment is the restriction of the operation to 10 weeks to the minimum stay of three nights. I think that's an important aspect that will restrict and um, discourage this to be used as a party venue. Uh, and the approval period of 18 months, which should give us plenty of time to review that policy. And then if this application comes before us at that time, we should have a clearer view of which direction we're going to move in. Thank you, councillors. We're speaking to the amendment. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, just to confirm, um, the officers say that they don't support uh, or wouldn't support... Uh, proposed condition 1.4, which is the three-night minimum, but just to confirm, by having it as a planning condition rather than being contained in the management plan, it means that any change to that would require a decision of council and could not be determined by administration. Is that correct? So 
sorry, just to confirm, the uh, question being that it needs to come back so through it's, council. It's the, three night, the, the reason that it says the officers don't support the three-night minimum is because it's already contained in the management plan, but because the, um, because the agreement to the management plan, and I assume any changes, is just subject to the agreement of the city, that means that it could be done outside of the council decision process, so therefore a change to that three-night minimum could occur without coming back to council unless it is included as a condition of planning approval. Just confirming that. Through Mayor Cole, uh, that is correct, and in order to confirm that, you need to elevate it out of the um, management plan and embed it as a condition of the approval. Um, yeah, so I'm supportive of the amendment, primarily because the applicant has indicated that they are uh, comfortable with what's proposed. I think there's clearly some um, some concern uh, in the general area, as we've seen for the last couple of applications for uh, short-term accommodation, but particularly uh, if, uh, whilst the applicant is free to apply for whatever they choose, if they're comfortable with uh, a more restrictive, um, uh, more restrictive conditions uh, whilst the uh, time-limited approval exists, then I'm comfortable to support that. Councillors? Um, look, I'll speak to it. I did ask for this to be prepared and I did meet with the applicant who I met for the first time at the meeting. Um, I did struggle with this. I've gone through the SAT, um, the recent SAT decision on the Moir Street address in great detail and, and really gone through some of the comments of the SAT member. One of the comments is really about the absence of um, policy and a scheme use currently in the City of Vincent, which we realise is an issue because we have that on our corporate business plan to develop this year. But the SAT member did say that the existing policy is not a planning instrument that informs or guides the exercise of planning discretion because it says nothing about what criteria should be applied in the planning assessment of where temporary accommodation should be permitted. So this is a problem. Um, it is uh, an unfortunate time for an application to be made in some respects, but we do have to deal with it because if we don't, it's a deemed refusal and we do need that policy in place and we do need a scheme amendment to make this a listed use. Um, in terms of the other commentary through the SAT decision on 8 Moyer Street, it talked about the fact that the use is acceptable in a heritage area. The, the language used was that it is benign from a heritage standpoint. It talked about the fact that um, one off-street parking bay was sufficient in terms of parking uh, one bay is sufficient. It did talk about that in that situation the context was purely residential. Um, the reason for upholding uh, Council's decision came down really to amenity and noise issues. talked about the fact that it, um, the houses are semi-detached and that is the same for this um, number two Brookman. Um, close urban environment, um, in, state, in the situation of the um, Moyer Street um, address, all adjoining properties had um, out, their outdoor areas in close proximity. Um, it was applying for a full short-term dwelling use as opposed to a partial use or ancillary, even though that's not deemed as part of the use term here. We are looking at a 10-week out, out of 12 months as opposed to 12 months um, operation of short-term dwelling. Um, it did talk about Brookman Moyer being a preserved residential enclave, which is something I do think we need to give consideration to, and talked about a holiday house being a more intense use with different outdoor areas, you, with the difference being that outdoor areas are often used more. Um, so it also talked about the fact that the site was not at the interface of another zone or in transition, which is very different in the case of two Brook Brookman Street, but both equally are zoned at residential R25. So it is something that I have given great consideration to. I don't think it's an easy decision, even though there are quite um, key differences here. I think the key differences being that to um, the application before us has the main living sp um, outdoor living area actually fronting the commercial zone. Um, it does have an adjoining wall, but the bedrooms that are going to be in use are not on that adjoining wall. Um, and it does have some shared external... You can actually see into the next-door neighbour's backyard, but, uh, but the way in which the outdoor furniture and pool is, is situated would entice people around to that, um, to that other aspect. So um, I did feel very uncomfortable about six months. I thought that that was just really too um, too much and that 10 weeks is more in keeping with someone actually being an owner-occupier who's using 
the ability to let out their home as they travel, which I understand is the applicant's intent. Um, the other factor of this um, proposed amendment is that the time-limited approval is for 18 months, and that that is really based on the question that I asked of the Acting Director of Strategy and Development around the time at which we could expect the policy to be in place. And I think that this is time to coincide with that so that when we do have that policy in place, we can review that again and see whether that is where the policy has landed once we've actually considered it and had the opportunity to undertake community consultation. So um, given that we have um, to either approve, approve with conditions or refuse, I thought that this was probably a um, reasonable place to land in that it allows a um, minimal operation for an owner-occupier with a very good um, management plan, three night minimum stay, a um, response time of one hour under the management plan of a local um, manager, um, which is which is again different to what was proposed in the other application. Um, I do note that there will be concerns from some residents about um, about that creep into a residential area, and I think that that is why it's really important that this is time limited, so that we can revisit this once we actually have a detailed policy position on um, using short-term accommodation as an ancillary use to a um, permanent residential home. So on balance, I um, am comfortable to move forward with the amendment. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments on the substantive motion? I'll put it. All those in favour? Oh, you did put your finger up. Go ahead. Um, I just thought I would probably just take a brief moment to say that um, two things. Um, one, I think that ultimately there are many elements of this application that make it more amenable to me than previous short-term applications, um, primarily around the maintenance of the residential home as the primary use of the premises, the 10-week now period for the short-term accommodation, the use of a local property manager to greet residents on site and check in and check out, and the three-night minimum stay. And so I think that an application like this would be something I would potentially ha be happy to discuss with the community as, a pro as we develop our short-term accommodation policy to see where those lines are in relation to, um, as Councillor Murphy said, the ability for residents to make use of their residential homes um, whilst they are... Um, on vacation somewhere themselves or to to um, use their homes um, for security or have people to stay while they're not there. Um, but I think that, I think ultimately where I get to on this one is that we haven't consulted with our community to see where those lines are and the community we did consult with have said that they object. And so I think we, you know, we don't have a short-term accommodation policy or a local planning scheme that provides any guidance to us about where site contents, context may be relevant. Um, and you know, so it's up to us. We're sort of feeling our way here in terms of saying that, well, we believe that you know, an interface with another zone on the basis of the SAT decision um, and potential um, minimal um, direct interface with residential neighbours is um, appropriate for site context, but the community could well resoundingly come back to us and say, no, nah, sorry. So I still have some concerns, probably from my perspective. The biggest thing here is that this is a time-limited approval, and I may not be in the chamber in 18 months, but if I am, I will absolutely say that there is no guarantee that simply um, one approval will guarantee any continuation um, should we have a new policy position after discussion with the community that um, this puts this application in conflict with. Um, I think the other thing from my perspective is in relation to the compliance, and I think that that will be absolutely crucial. I think at this point in time the city has um, is flying a little blind with short-term accommodation, and the reading that I've already done on the short-term accommodation review, um, I appreciate there's a detailed commentary coming from administration, is that compliance is challenging already um, and that the burden of compliance action falls primarily with the neighbours and I'm concerned about this. Um, I have one question in relation to um, the time limit um, If um, through you to the Acting Director of Development and Design, remember that right? Yes. Um, if we're talking 10 weeks accommodation, if a, uh, the resident is um, absent from the property for 14 days the property is let as short-term accommodation for two days, then there is a gap of 10 days, and then there is a two-day 
um, another uh, booking, does that count as four days or 14 days in relation to this approval? Yeah, no, sorry, excuse my maths. Let's say three days with a gap and then three days so that we're all compliant with our other conditions. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, in that scenario, um, for that gap, which is when it would not be leased for that purpose, um, it would not count towards the, um, the use of short-term dwelling. And can I also just get some commentary in relation to the, um, the use of the car bays? Um, I understand that the applicant has two off-site vehicle parking and they are both u both utilised by vehicles, um, and that the current um, motion calls for the residential parking permit, which will be available to guests at all times. Um, I guess I would appreciate um, some uh, commentary in relation to the potential consequences if the residential parking permit was not able to be utilised by guests of the property. Um, yeah. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so just on that point, uh, there are two off-street um, car parking bays on site. Um, they are uh, being utilised by the landowner for parking of their own vehicles. Um, the proposal uh, is ultimately to utilise one residential parking permit um, associated with short-term dwelling for those guests. Now, if that was not made available to the uh, occupants during the short-term dwelling use, um, ultimately it would need to be made clear um, through the guest information sheet or through the booking prior um, that there is no um, parking base available for that use uh, and council would need to be satisfied at this stage if this was to be approved um, that nil car parking provided on site was appropriate given the site's location. Um, with that in mind, I'd just like to put forward an amendment that the um, management plan dated 20 September 19 is modified to the satisfaction of the city to state that nil car parking is provided on site and no residential permits are provided for guests of the development. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Seconded, Councillor Hallett. Um, as I said, I think that this application has a number of features that would make it something that I would think we would be able to talk with the community about um, as, as a short-term accommodation policy. I think one of the issues is that um, in general terms where we have a um, non-residential use, we require that there is some provision of parking on site. This is what we've done for other permanent short-term accommodation options. Um, we've also approved... Um, accommodation options within um, this area or very in, in the, the um, in close proximity to this area um, with less parking um, or no parking provision for guests because it is considered to be um, an area where um, guests that are coming in to stay wouldn't necessarily need or be expected to have a car um, and I think this is something that has been raised as concerned by residents um, and so I would like to see addressed over the course of this application if possible. Councillor Hallett, you don't wish to speak to the amendment? Does anyone wish to speak to the amendment to remove the ability to use a residential permit from the management plan? No? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried with Councillor Murphy voting against. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the substantive motion. All those in favour? declare it carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, the second item raised this evening is 9.4, which is 396 to 398 Fitzgerald Street, North Perth, proposed change of use from office to unlisted use Cat Hotel. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Loden seconded. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, ma'am. Um, fully support this proposal. I visited the site um, and was very impressed with um, the vision for that location. I think it's going to make a great addition there at the bottom of the street. Um, I get this image of young kids, me potentially walking past and seeing um, these cats sitting in the window. Um, 
particularly intrigued by the penthouse concept. <laughs> it is um, maybe not entirely for me, but I'm sure there's people out there that would love to do that, and I'd be fascinated to see the cats that end up in that penthouse. Um, I think the, the plans in place are, are going to uh, manage the impacts from this really well. There's a, a large distance between this site and any adjoining neighbours who might be experiencing noise issues. There's a, a separate road, a car park, and all of the cats are orientated towards the front of the development, which is also ideal because that's the active frontage, so that'll provide a really good active frontage in that location as well. Um, I did have some questions about um, how this would uh, translate into FOGO. I can appreciate um, that that will be difficult to manage uh, for the city, uh, so it is a shame, but um, I think I can accept that one uh, this time round. Um, but uh, I won't make a habit of it, Director. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my full support. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Yes, I'm supportive of this application. I think it's been um, designed and the management plan has been developed to um, mitigate concerns around um, impacts on adjoining neighbours. I agree that the active street frontage is a bonus and I think that um, this is a unique offering that will um, provide some interest along Fitzgerald Street. Councillors, Councillor Hallett. I'm happy to support this. Um, I think it's great that we've got um, someone who's so passionate about uh, filling a niche in the community and um, putting this much uh, level of thought into a, a proposal and um, I look forward to seeing it come to fruition um, and perhaps we can uh, move from our aspiration of dog capital to cat capital of WA. <laughs> Councillors? Um, I just want to commend the applicant because I have um, very rarely had such a detailed and comprehensive um, deputation brought forward and I'm, I do apologise if you felt cut off this evening but I felt you had covered it all so well that it got to the end of when we came to this item there were actually no questions because every question that we threw at you at the site visit you were able to answer incredibly well and it's been all been very thought th um, well thought through so um, just really it is a first for the city of Vincent we now have doggy daycare and a cat hotel um, so we do wish you all the best and hope that you can meet your um, your hope of opening in time for Christmas and thanks again for such a comprehensive application to the council I think it's really helped you get this application through um, quickly so Thank you for that. Are there any further comments in relation to this application? OK, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. OK, the next item is 9.1, number 51 Albert Street, North Perth. Proposed alterations and additions to the club premises and change of use from club premises to club premises and childcare premises and licence for use of car park at number 160 Albert Street, North Perth. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Loden. Just a, a couple of questions first. Um, <coughs> just wondering if you can comment on the complaints that um, have been alleged to have been received about the current use um, and any relevance that has for considering the current application. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, can confirm that there has been complaints received and that the city's health team is working with the um, operators to manage uh, and review that process. In terms of this current application, as that the hall use is already approved, that doesn't form part of the consideration for this evening. Um, and also, can you we clarify that um, ranges are available on the weekend in the case of um, complaints or concerns? <laughs> Through you, Michael, I'll take that. Uh, yeah, they are available on the weekend. Thanks. I'm happy to support the um, officer's recommendation um, on this. I think um, there'll probably be some monitoring, but um, it's good to see more childcare facilities and um, in, in Vincent. So happy to support it. Councillors? Um, I'm also happy to support this application, and particularly... Uh, happy to see the childcare premises being included and formalised in this in this way as well. I think that'll be a valuable addition for the community. We do have challenges finding good locations for our childcare facilities. Those have come up in the past as well, so it's good to see this this use continue. I do recognise the the issue of noise and the, and the issue of noise complaints, and that's as we've sort of seen from previous discussion as well, a, a challenge that the city is going to have to ongoing manage as well. But overall, I'm happy to support the. Uh, the officer recommendation. Councillors, 
Um, I do have a question that was raised by a um, member of the public gallery this evening in relation to the 6.30 a.m. start. Could you just comment on whether you think that, because I note our policy is 7 a.m., can you comment on the um, whether you believe that would cause any impacts to the surrounding residential area by having that additional half hour? Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, that's correct. The city's policy prescribes a 7am to 7pm and the applicants seeking discretion to commence from 6.30am and conclude at 6.30pm. To support that, they provided an acoustic report that demonstrated that the noise during that pick up and drop off would be minimal and would still be able to comply with the applicable noise requirements that are slightly reduced prior to 7am. Uh, they also are uh, proposing different management measures to help to mitigate the impacts on that. So they have a consolidated entry point from the southern side where the main car park would be and they anticipate most parents would be doing drop off and anticipate that through uh, their sign up and information to prospective parents, they would note about this early uh, commencement time and the requirement for people to drop off in that furthest car park to avoid any potential impacts on the closest residential properties. Thank you very much, Coordinator. Councillor Toppenberg. Thank you. Just to follow up a couple of questions. Uh, the comment, well, the comments, the answer to the question talked about they anticipate, or that the the, um, the operators anticipate. Uh, is it previously, if you take, for example, the Summer Street um, uh, childcare centre, which is immediately adjacent to residential, we've been very strict about who can be dropped off where and when. Uh, the in the event that uh, users of the facility choose to um, access through the foyer and front entrance and not through the southern car park. Is that something that's covered in the management plan or is that something that we have any control over or is that something that would need to be conditioned uh, if it was required, for example, that that be the only access point uh, other than for emergency exit prior to 9am or something of that nature? Through you, Mayor Cole, there is a condition of approval that requires the management plan to be um, venue management plan to be provided and approved by the city. So we can capture that through that subsequent approval process. Um, that access prior to 7 a.m. would need to be through that southern entry point and pick up and drop off in that location as well. Okay, and given the nature of uh, childcare uh, and certainly early arrivals, uh, the uh, if we were of a mind to limit the use of Playground 3 and Playground 4, which were immediately adjacent to the uh, residences on Macedonia Place. Is that something that would need to be done via condition or is that also something that you feel would be comfortable with the city's officers negotiating through the management plan? Through you, Mayor Cole. I uh, believe we could do it through the management plan as well. The acoustic report has already identified that they would need to have some management measures in place in regards to um, mitigating potential noise impacts of the play areas. The applicant has mentioned that the 6.30 drop-off time wouldn't be a high volume of people arriving at that time, uh, so we don't believe that that would result in a, a big impact um, if there were children arriving or even playing at that time. So just uh, for, if that... Uh, and if that was uh, to present as an issue, is that something that the city has the ability to mitigate through uh, the management plan after the approval is granted? Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yep, so condition 2.3 requires the submission of a venue management plan and that would need to um, include predicted noise levels of those play areas and if uh, they were found to be in breach of that then through our compliance team we could investigate and require modification to their practices. Are you still thinking? Well, without without the condition requiring a review of the management plan, a periodic review of the management plan, uh, just confirming that it doesn't, but without a periodic review being required, uh, and I guess as the neighbour across the road pointed out in his um, presentation this evening, there sometimes can be a difference either in measurements or in perceived noise or otherwise, and I certainly know the sound of one child pushing a plastic toy over, over brick paving at 6.40 in the morning can be something that would, uh, on a daily basis, even if it's just one child and one toy, which may not necessarily breach the noise regulations, may not be something that people wish to be living across the road from five days a week. Uh, I will... Um, 
I'll let the debate continue, but I will just foreshadow that I will seek to have condition 2.3 amended to include a 2.3.2 that just says that it will probably include a 24-month uh, review or something of that nature that gives the city the ability to go back to that management plan over time. So if you just give Would me a moment, I'll Would you like to move that it. now, Councillor Toppelberg? Uh, I'm not so sure how long I want it to be, so give me a moment okay. if that's okay. We'll move on. Any um, councillors wish to speak while Councillor Toppelberg drafts his amendment? Okay, I will. Yep. Um, I think that we have we have obviously been finding um, locations for childcare a little bit tricky in the city of Vincent recently. Um, we have noticed, I mean, personally, I, I think we are seeing that childcare is changing from the sort of corner house on the end of the residential street with, say, 35 children to um, really moving towards childcare that is 100 plus in its operation. Um, so I think that in, in terms of uh, an adaptive reuse, if you like, of this of this building, um, the Macedonian um, Club. I think that this is a, a, a smart way to re um, reimagine and reuse this building. It is something that we are hearing there is a need for, and um, I think that in relation to having. Um, less numbers approved and for lesser hours. I know that we are looking at a 6.30 a.m. start, but in terms of this practice, there will be no noise after 6.30 p.m. for the ground floor of the um, of the building and there will be no um, weekend activity emanating from that um, ground floor. So I think that that will hopefully go some way to dealing with um, a change from a full function centre to a childcare and function centre um, and I think that's of benefit to the broader community in servicing a need for childcare given that we do have quite a strong young population in the city of Vincent. So I am supportive but I'm also interested in hearing this amendment to really sort of drill down into the management plan to ensure that it is working and to give uh, the city an option to review and tweak if necessary. Okay, so thank you, Mayor Cole. So it will be a new 2.3.2, so under venue, venue management plan, and it would read, the management plan shall be reviewed and approved by the city annually. In the event, uh, I've got, I'll send through the wording in a sec, or if you're quick to type, that's even better. In the event the city does not, is, that the city is not seeking any modification to the management plan, no review will be required. If I get a second, I will talk to it. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Gondrzewski. So not seeking to be unduly onerous and not seeking to have a time-limited approval or anything of that nature, but I do think that if uh, some of those uh, <coughs> finer grain issues that can be managed out but without the planning controls to be able to uh, enforce it, um, they can become contentious unnecessarily. I think this just gives the city the ability. Uh, there are, it, It's not at the city's disposal to unnecessarily uh, withhold or restrict uh, what has been approved in the initial management plan, but it does give the ability annually uh, for if those issues do arise and they're not able to be resolved through compliance to actually resolve them through the planning approval. May I ask a question? Is this in perpetuity in that it must be reviewed every year forever after? That's why the option is there. If, if the city is not seeking any modification, the review, no review will be required. So okay. it's, it basically gives the opportunity every 12 months if there is any, an issue. But it's, if it's not required, then it just lapses. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Gondrzewski. I have a question to administration. Just if, how will the city go through the process of determining whether a review is required if they don't review records of complaint? I, I'll just ask that question because I think I might have some comment on it. Through Mayor Cole, it might be better to, well, one, we would have no way <laughs> to um, seek review. However, there, there's still a number of avenues. So if we did receive complaint in regards to noise and the hours of operation and um, impact that that's resulting in, then um, one, we can monitor what hours of operation they are operating within. And two, there is a condition of approval 2.2 um, that requires compliance with the acoustic report. And the acoustic report had identified within it a number of measures to mitigate that noise so that it complied um, with the applicable noise regulations at the different times. Um, so if, if it is noise that is of concern, then we still have an avenue through the acoustic report. 
if we want to pursue the venue management plan modified condition, then we can look to amend that wording um, to suggest the venue management plan should be reviewed and approved by the city annually. Mm, and where the city does not require any modification to the management plan, no further approval is required, but that doesn't negate the need to continue to comply with it. I can appreciate Councillor Toppleberg's sentiment. I think there's a possible better wording for the second part of that sentence. However, I think what's been suggested there essentially means that you do you might do one review once and if you don't think it is necessary then you never have to do another review again. And I think the idea is that it's <coughs> that um, anyway, so I'm fairly supportive, but I'm just gonna have a quick think about how the wording could be amended. Can I ask a question through you? Uh, in the event that this amendment is not successful, uh, and let's just, and for argument's sake, there are um, six, 6 6.30 a.m. drop-offs in year five of operation, and they all utilise uh, playground three and four. That's where they get, the, until seven o'clock till there are more people, that's where these kids uh, are sent to go and play, and those kids are noisy, but just under the uh, noise regulations. If this wasn't successful, what would the, had the city have at its disposal to be able to try and ensure that the, those, that those noise impacts were mitigated at immediately opposite residential dwellings at 6.30 in the morning? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, similar to what we are doing at the moment with their current operations, we'll try to work with them to understand their management practices. Um, and we do have those conditions recommended on there regarding a management plan and setting out how they would manage those potential noisy uses in the early hours. And we would just try to work to see um, if there was some modification that might be required. If it's, for instance, that they've got all 20 kids out there at that time, uh, we might perhaps suggest that they consider splitting it and um, monitoring that, as they've suggested themselves in the acoustic report. Uh, and just a further question, in the event this amendment was successful, at no more than 11 months and 29 days later, could the city require that those, <coughs> those playgrounds were not, uh, not used between the hours of 6.30 and 7 a.m., as an example? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, whether it's this condition or the acoustic report, uh, they have made a commitment that those uses at that time would not um, result in an amenity impact. And if it was found to be that it was, then we would have an avenue to seek compliance. Um, can I just ask if um, the Summer Street childcare premises has requires an annual review of their um, management plan? And if so, how arduous that process is? Through Mayor Cole, I wouldn't be able to answer that, sorry. Councillor Loden. Just to clarify my understanding, um, so venue management, under this proposed amend amendment, a venue management plan is required to be reviewed. If the city reviews that plan the first year and then it's all compliant, and then subsequently for multiple years, well, then we, we, we never have to review it again, is that the correct way to interpret it? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, so the intention would be to get a management plan, um, have it in effect for 12 months, then review it, and if there is no issues identified in that 12-month period, then it wouldn't require further review, but it would still be in effect. So if issues did arise five years, 10 years down the track, then we would seek compliance with that approved management plan or investigate to determine what is resulting in the non-compliance. So if um, for the first year, um, only very quiet kids come to the daycare, um, but then a whole heap of noisy kids join at 12 months and one day um, because we've reviewed it and that was all okay at that point, um, there wouldn't be any mechanism to review after that? Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. There would be no mechanism to review, but we would still be able to enforce compliance. So if there was uh, a change to the management or um, which was resulting in that increased noise, then there's still the requirement to comply with the noise 
um, requirements as they've stated in their acoustic report and to manage it in accordance with that venue management plan. So we would seek compliance with those two elements. Sorry, just a point of clarification. That's different to what the amendment says because the amendment says annually. It's at the discretion of the city whether that annually is every year, every two years or after the noisy kids arrive. But my reading, well, my proposal of the amendment is annually means each year, but it's at the city's discretion not to review in any given year. Okay, we have clarification. Uh, we are debating this amendment. Does anyone wish to speak to it? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare, declare it carried unanimously. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments in relation to this development application? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare the item carried. Uh, the next item raised is 9.5, which is number 9, Baker Avenue, Perth, proposed change of use from single house to single house and unlisted use music studio. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Move Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Loden. Uh, <coughs> thank you. So um, I am uh, very supportive of this proposal. Um, Thank you to the applicant. Um, this is, as far as I'm concerned, an extraordinary opportunity for our community. It's a, a recognised world-class studio um, that he is opening uh, to the community for the first time. Um, and I think it's a gift and a opportunity um, for the celebration of high-end uh, jazz uh, in Vincent and is certainly in line with um, our broad vision of being an arts capital of uh, Perth. Um, I guess a lot of the stuff was covered by um, the numerous people who spoke to it tonight. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of other points. Um, I do actually think, even though you know we're talking relatively low numbers of people, um, that there are economic benefits, obviously supporting local musicians, but um, also, given the fact that there won't be any food or beverage um, allowed at the uh, venue, that there'll be um, hungry and thirsty people uh, before and after the uh, music concerts, I would imagine. Um, and I do believe that that is uh, a benefit to the Beaufort Street businesses. Um, I, th I understand the um, neighbours' uh, concerns around noise. Um, I do want to reference um, the context of the area in the sense that um, uh, there's a stadium a couple of hundred metres away, open air, 10,000 people. There is Perth's biggest nightlife uh, and entertainment district, probably 300 metres away. Um, 50 metres to, to Beaufort Street was a significant economic hub. So it's not exactly a retirement village in the countryside. Uh, it's a vibrant, active uh, area, very close to the CBD, um, and I think that needs to be taken into account. Um, also, just a couple of comments um, in relation to uh, the deputation. Um, I do want to actually say from my personal um, view that I am actually a professional myself, and I am raising a young family in a home. Um, and. It is actually right behind a nightclub. Um, the nightclub runs uh, into the early hours of the morning um, and I would barely know that it's there and it has zero impact on my uh, children and on my own uh, amenity. Um, and I think that uh, perhaps that there might be a... Um, a little bit of confusion or overinflation about the, what the actual impact of this um, would be. Um, this is a sound fortress. <laughs> it may as well be 50 feet under the ground as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's zero chance of any noise spill. Um, and also, 
uh, as demonstrated tonight by the people who have been talking. We're talking high-end jazz. We're talking chin strokers and wine sippers. Well, they can't even have wine, so they'll be stroking their chins. Um, and uh, walking to and from the venue, uh, I would imagine murmuring maybe uh, how fantastic the sharp nine was over the diminished seventh chord. <laughs> Certainly won't be... Uh, yelling out, uh, you know, Troy, let's go to the pub, mate, or any of that uh, stuff. I, um, I think it'll be very, very subdued, um, and I think that uh, it's probably misfounded. Um, yes. So anyway, um, I actually support uh, the um, amendment, which I will um, foreshadow putting forward, um, to actually, because I actually believe that this is um, too confined. I don't actually think that um, that this approval gives the concert um, club a proper chance of success. Um, and so I foreshadow uh, putting up an amendment, but um, after everyone else has had a say. Thanks. Council Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have to confess I'm an engineer by degree, so... Um, when I think about this in an artistic context, I'm probably fall more into the um, art appreciator category. Um, but um, there has been a strong uh, contingent of people coming here to, to talk about how beneficial this is going to be to the arts community, and I fully appreciate that as well. I guess the challenge that we have to deal with is the planning aspects of this, and in my mind, the real challenge is around noise. Now, having visited the site, I can see that the noise that is occurring within the venue is going to be well contained. It is set up and designed for that specific purpose. The challenge will come down to entry and exit from the site. Um, and appreciate fully the, 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 this is talk of a, as a jazz precinct and so forth. There's nothing in the conditions that requires a certain demographic of people to visit the site. I don't think we would want to do that. And I'm not suggesting that there's anything untoward going on here, but uh, we have to look at it on its planning merits as well. Um, that being said, I do support this proposal. I think it is going to make a valuable addition to the community. Um, when we talk about the uh, access to and from the venue, we do have an exit management plan, and it's particularly the exit from the venue, I think, that we really need to be really careful how we manage. Um, people entering the venue, given the duration of the, the restrictions and the time frames, are going to be entering at 7 o'clock at, at night. Um, where it's more acceptable to have volume of noise. Um, but at 10 o'clock of night, at the end, when people are leaving, that's when you actually really want to be managing the noise aspects there, and that's what's going to have to be very carefully detailed between the city and the applicant around people getting out of the venue. Um, the time-limited approval, the initial six months, um, I think is too short because the intent here is to see if this works, and I can't see how you can get a genuine picture of this working or not working and how that's going to impact the neighbours in that sort of time frame because um, it's going to take time to get these events in place and set up and operating um, and get a number of people um, attending the, the location as well to actually test that the, the hours of operation and the numbers of people and what that consequence has for the community. Um, I'll leave the proposed amendments to others to move, um, but I am supportive of extending those time frames and providing a bit of flexibility to the applicant around when those things are used. Um, but it is a time-limited approval, so I think um, uh, the applicant needs to be well aware that if uh, it does not operate in the way that, uh, that we're expecting and if there is a large number of complaints, then the, that a, um, a less favourable outcome may be coming forward from council at that time when that comes back in the future for our consideration, assuming it is approved at this time. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, this, is, this is a unique application. Uh, I think uh, the question was fairly raised earlier and um, uh, by the neighbour asking whether this would be considered had the venue not been constructed. And I think given the residential zoning, I think that that is something that uh, people can ponder, but doesn't really matter because the, the fact is that the, the venue itself exists. Uh, uh, the compliance issues relating to its construction, I wasn't aware of until the discussions that we just had. But uh, I, I had some uh, discussion with um, uh, a local resident, uh, not that nearby, but um, some discussion online with uh, somebody over the last couple of days in relation to the application. And for me, the 
if I can summarise what I read as the administration's response, it effectively says that it's, it's a unique and potentially unsuitable proposal, uh, but the application and the intent has enough merit to warrant a, limited, a time limited approval to allow an on-ground assessment of the impact and the potential to manage the use appropriately. Should that be possible, it would be an interesting and unique addition to the city, and should it not be possible, the city has a number of measures at its disposal to discontinue the use and refuse any future application. For me, the I have heard and uh, enjoyed and we've... we've Sorry, Councillor Topper, who were you just quoting? Me. Oh, they're your words. <laughs> Didn't you oh, love it? How, how good learned. was that? <laughs> I can email I it to you if you like. pulling on some learned planning professional. I, no, no. It was a conversation with one of our great noise complainers. As a, I don't, I'm sure you can guess who that is. Um, but the... the and I, look, I, I, I ran for council 10 years ago... Uh, uh, and I still remember the line in my little A6 flyer, which talked about uh, becoming a, a hub for art, design, and create the arts, design and creativity. <laughs> I've enjoyed uh, the passion and listening to people talking about its value as a music venue. But if I'm to be brutally frank and honest, given that the room is soundproofed, it is of little relevance for me really. What goes on within the room is a personal matter for the people who enjoy it, and what I feel about that is separate to the planning considerations. For, the, for me, this is about a residential property with an R50 zoning with a driveway entrance and exit uh, to it that is potentially seeking to have X number of people uh, attending um, for a commercial venture in a residential zone, and that's the key consideration. I accept that the venue is soundproof and therefore the sound emanating from the venue itself is not an issue. I accept that the conditions mean that Aston Lane will be uh, completely protected. Uh, I don't disagree that we don't, uh, with people who say we don't have control over what people do uh, when they leave the venue and their ability to uh, potentially wander into Aston Lane, then that's something that uh, we face being on the edge of Northbridge um, every day in that, in that location and opposite a park as well. So that's something that uh, is not wholly the, the responsibility of the applicant and this application. So the the issue of the time-limited approval, um, and so that we're not all foreshadowing it, given that I'd asked for it, I will move the amendment on the green just with one modification, and that is 2.6. Uh, my amendment had actually said that the hours shall, uh, of operation should be 9am to 7pm, not 7 till 7. So that's so a, as written on the green, but if you go down to 2.6, get going, yeah, so 2.6, the morning hour is at 9. So... Um, with a seconder, if you'll indulge me, I'll go through each of the change or proposed change conditions and explain my reasoning. Is there a seconder for the Green? Councillor Murphy seconding. Okay, so the first and probably the most significant is the length of time, uh, and people will have different views on it. I landed, I know the applicant had sought uh, an open ended approval and uh, said that these things could be managed. I don't think. Uh, that that is palatable given the residential zoning. I think six months given the fact that it takes three months to process an application means that it's effectively a three-month approval is completely un uncommercial and unreasonable for all people involved. Uh, 18 months gives, uh, and I'll get to some of the conditions that control what I assume would be neighbours' concern about what if it goes wrong from day one. I'll deal with that later. But 18 months, I think, is a reasonable period of time to be able to... Uh, book acts, but perhaps most importantly, actually make the investment that is required for the sound attenuation, uh, and particularly with that entrance and exit point. I think that to ask for uh, permanent uh, soundproof or sound mitigating material to be invested in uh, for a six-month period is, is unreasonable, and we probably wouldn't get the best possible result, whereas I think this gives the uh, a length of time that gives that, that confidence to the applicant to be able to make that investment, um, but also enough uh, uh, a short enough time period that, uh, in the event that it doesn't uh, it doesn't operate as intended, that the community is not saddled with this for uh, for a length of time that is completely unpalatable. Um, the uh, and effectively that changes 2.1 to a maximum of uh, one event per month, which is uh, I understand goes over uh, potentially four four evenings, but that is. Uh, there may be months where there aren't, but because it restricts it to one uh, event per calendar month, that means that I doubt that in 18 months we would see 18 different events, but uh, it, it limits it to no more than one per month. Um, the musical performance times are changed slightly, particularly on the Saturday, so that we don't end up with the oddity of being <coughs> non-compliant because somebody was playing... Uh, if I think that that... Will, uh, where are we? At... Uh, 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 so Saturday was two. Oh, sorry, it was suggested to be two p.m. till ten p.m. I've given the allowance for the a Saturday morning performance. Uh, last week in the briefing, we did have the suggestion of two split performances on the Saturday, which I thought was unnecessary. Um, and the Sunday hours, as per the recommendation, um, 
2.3 is specific about not splitting those over separate weekends so that you don't have a Friday one week, the Saturday the week after, the Sunday the week after. Uh, so it contains an event into um, a weekend. Uh, 2.4 is uh, the Jade and I do orchestra amendment, uh, which effectively uh, over that time or over a 12 month period gives the ability to host events not on a weekend with written consent uh, and approval from the city. So it's not something that just can surprise the neighbours. Uh, and it does pull back those hours to a 9 p.m. finish time, given that they would be uh, they would be weekdays. Um, the I'll leave 2.5 for a moment, which is uh, the number of persons. 2.6 uh, differs from the city and in, in, is a little bit more restrictive. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a great need for <coughs> musical performances prior to 9 a.m. Um, but one of the key considerations for me is also the proximity and the use of Baker Avenue for foot traffic, particularly for the uh, attendance to the school. Uh, and by not allowing it to operate during those hours at any time, I think that it just gives that guarantee that you're not going to have that conflict of uh, school attendees and uh, the business. Um, the other key element that is here is uh, three, the addition of Clause 3.3. I will note that different in the officer recommendation, but uh, in 3.1, the patron numbers were explicit in the venue management plan here. It wasn't in the, in the briefing agenda, but that has been added by the officers. Um, but the addition of Clause 3.3 uh, says, uh, and this, I guess, ties into the, my comfortability with the extended period of the... Um, of the time limited approval is that the management plan shall be reviewed no less than six months and no more than nine months after the date, which effectively gives time for the, uh, the business or the, the venue to start operating. Uh, it can operate for six months, so if, you know, if there is a hiccup along the way, it gives them a chance to deal with it. But that is, a, for me, a reasonable period of time for uh, the applicant to be able to prove themselves to the neighbours and their surrounding community and ultimately they may well have proven themselves to the music community already with the construction of their premises, but this is about proving it can exist in a residential context. Uh, and because that would then re the venue management plan would require the approval of the city, things like occupancy numbers or hour of op hours of operation are able to be reviewed then. So for me, the officer's intent of a six-month approval is captured in that condition in that if there are any concerns or issues that, are, that need to be mitigated by either numbers or hours, which are, the, I guess, the key elements, leaving the, the acoustic report aside, that opportunity will be uh, before the officers somewhere uh, within the first nine months. So, given Can that I, I just spoke... ask a procedural question? How would that be possible if some of the numbers on patrons are conditions? I'm coming the... back to that. That's why okay. I said I'll come back to the patron numbers. So, um, I have uh, tried to remove some of the complexity uh, that was in condition 2.4 uh, as proposed by the officers. Uh, now, there is a key concern that it was only, I only really became aware of today. I note that it was uh, in the report, but the occupancy numbers, and I will ask a question, the current occupancy numbers for the current <coughs> built form, which has one male and one female toilet and one exit, uh, limits the capacity of the building to 50 people. Is that correct? That's correct. Through you, Mayor Cole. And so in order to be, to be able to accommodate any more than 50 people at any one time, there will need to be the construction of two additional toilets and an additional emergency exit. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Is that emergency exit required to be in a particular direction? Is it required to go to the lane or is that emergency exit, uh, for example, uh, would it be from the upper floor via a staircase or would it be, or is it, is there able to be another emergency exit that is able to be constructed facing the Baker Avenue side of the property? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, I would need to confirm, but ultimately it, the, the rationale is that there is just a second exit point um, noting that there is already an exit um, onto Baker Avenue, um, notwithstanding there's some uh, non-compliance matters in terms of the way the door opens out into Baker Avenue. That would need to be addressed, but ultimately... Uh, no, sorry, not Baker. The, correct, the lane. Um, that would need to be addressed as part of this, but uh, there's no reason why that couldn't be utilised. OK, and, and this is really is a key issue for me, so just we had the discussion today. The provision of portal loose, for want of a better term, is not uh, able to satisfy the BCA requirement for additional toilets unless certified. But 
Oh, so that's so let's just for clarity just confirm that please. To you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Okay, and the if the applicant was of a mind to install or to request the installation of certified portal loos in their driveway, for example, either on a temporary or semi permanent basis, would that require a development application or would that require any uh, any change to the current approval or the, the proposed approval? Do you, Mayor Cole, um, as part of your amendment, there is a uh, condition or in condition 3.1 relating to the venue management plan, uh, there's an explicit point, uh, probably midway down that, just dot point, sorry, uh, but approximately halfway down that says um, portable toilets are not to be permitted to be installed on the site itself. So ultimately we're trying to address it through the venue management plan. Um, that's probably most appropriate. Uh, if uh, there were toilets to be proposed on site, um, ultimately that would need to be um, a permanent structure and need to go through the DA um, process. Okay, and so, and I know it's not the intent, but if the applicant come, if this were to be approved and the applicant was to say, to turn up to council offices in three weeks and say, we've only got 18 months, we're not gonna go and invest in toilets, can we just have portal loose for that period of time? Can we, you know, if it works out, we'll construct them permanently thereafter. Is it open to the officers to approve that unless we explicitly remove it from the venue management plan condition and make it a condition of approval? Is that something that is open to officers to approve without coming back to council? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, technically, um, yes, that would be available to officers. However, I would suggest that that wouldn't be pursued on the basis that there's an explicit condition that refers to <coughs> no portable toilets um, being installed on the site uh, and that being considered through that management plan. So my advice is that, uh, no, that wouldn't be supported um, through the officers themselves, um, but ultimately uh, it doesn't form an explicit condition uh, and it's not elevated out of that management plan. Okay, so the proposed condition 2.5 that sits on the amendment, which says the musical performance outlining condition 2 shall have a maximum occupancy of 100 persons in attendance at any given time, that condition uh, is obviously um, overridden by the Building Code of Australia, but would it be necessary, and I'll let it sit within this, but would it be necessary to further amend or advisable to further amend that condition in the event that the amendment is a, the amendment on the whole is uh, approved, to say that the uh, occupancy shall be in accordance with the BCA, but at no point shall exceed whatever number council is comfortable with, would that be a better way to word it? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, that is available to you to uh, to move that amendment. However, uh, administration's approach has been to cap the number of patrons. Um, that is a standalone planning condition uh, rather than tying it explicitly to uh, other legislation. Uh, and then by virtue of an advice note, I believe it's advice note number nine, um, it refers to the need to still comply with occupancy numbers based on the other legislation that you've referred to, building and health. Okay, given that advice and the explicit recorded construction, uh, discussion about the uh, portal loos. I won't seek to change that any further, so I'm happy to leave that amendment as is. Thank you. Um, I'm just yeah. checking, was it you, Councillor? Oh, so, yeah, I second it. Thank yeah. you. Um, so that all sounds really good to me. Uh, thank you for your work on that, uh, Councillor Toppelberg. Just on the uh, toilets, um, so uh, I'm just interested in terms of, um, so essentially the way I read it currently is that they would, <coughs> in order to have 100 people there, they would need to construct another two toilets and a disabled toilet. Is that right? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the advice I've received is that they need to uh, provide an additional male urinal and one uh, disabled toilet. Um, right, okay. Uh, and is there any way that we could, uh, like I guess, 
you know, there has been times in the past where council has been able to um, circumnavigate certain um, rules when it comes to those sort of things. Is there um, any way that we could uh, reduce that <laughs> condition? <laughs> Sorry, Jimmy, that's, out. that's not part of the planning application. That's a state government requirement for a, for a public building. Yes, yeah, sorry, if I could answer that. Yes, ask, you wish ask, to elaborate, another manager. Question. <clears throat> Through you, Mayor Cole, um, I agree with your comments. Um, uh, ultimately, it does need to be signed off by a certified um, build, building survey as well, and they are bound by the same legislation that you've referred to. Um, I guess given the fact that there's no food or um, drink available, um, it might be as extenuating circumstances. But I'm interested, um, so the jazz cellar in um, Mount Hawthorne um, a number of years ago was uh, conditioned that it needed a um, disabled access. Um, and I believe that the council at that time, this is a, many years ago, <clears throat> um, somehow... Uh, managed that they would get their building approval but uh, without the dis disability access given that it was a special um, community use. And I'm just wondering if you um, are aware of that or and, and how that may have occurred. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, I'm not aware of the um, specifics relating to that um, to that particular uh, development. Um, notwithstanding that, that could be prepared separately. But nonetheless, um, I guess I maintain the comment um, that the building code still applies uh, and ultimately uh, it would need to be certified um, that it is safe and compliant with that legislation by uh, a certified building surveyor. So um, I would maintain that. Councillors, we're debating the amendment. Councillor Carson. No further, no further questions. Thank you. I support the amendment. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Look, I, I'm very supportive of this item and the amendment. Um, I agree. I don't think six months is long enough to establish this business and to really test whether it's appropriate um, and manageable in this location. Um, it pains me, but I do have to ask a question about toilets. <laughs> It seems such a shame in an in um, application like this to spend so much time talking about the toilets. Um, but I just want to clarify, uh, given that the current capacity is 50 people, they have an um, a approval or would have an approval from us for 100. Um, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get some assurance that if further toilet construction was proposed to happen outside of the existing studio, that that would come back to us at Council. Because um, I agree with Councillor Loden that the biggest issue here is entry and exit. And if those to new toilets, for example, were to be constructed either in the driveway area or in the courtyard area, that that might create further noise with people coming in and out of the studio to go um, to those facilities. So uh, I guess my question is, if, we, if this is approved as is, um, would that type of construction definitely come back to council? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so in that scenario where uh, toilets external to the venue was being proposed, um, that would require a development application. And ultimately, that development application would be for an addition to this uh, going to presume that this is approved, it would be in addition to um, this development and on the basis that it has been considered by Council previously, it would be presented to yourselves. And uh, just on that, in terms of the venue management, um, that would also need to be uh, modified in any case to address um, patrons um, leaving the venue to go to the toilet as well. So and any implications in terms of noise associated with that and managing that. Councillor Castle, do you have anything further? Councillor Hallett? Um, just to clarify my reading of the amendment and the original um, recommendation, there is no um, prohibition about food and beverages um, being served or consumed in, in or outside the venue. Um, 
Can you just confirm that? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, that is correct. So uh, if you refer to the briefing report, the recommendation from uh, administration uh, was for the venue management plan to explicitly prohibit the serving of food and beverages um, on site to patrons. Um, since then, uh, administration has removed that uh, prohibition from the venue management plan on the basis that that is still you still need to comply with all health requirements, as well as in terms of the noise uh, potentially associated with doing such activity outside of the venue, um, that could generate some noise. That was really the concern from administration. But if that was to be done, for example, inside the venue um, where it is acoustically designed, um, that would present less of an issue from a noise perspective. So on that basis, um, the recommendation was to remove that prohibition. Thank you. I'm supportive of the amendment um, and assuming it, if it gets up, um, I would like to flag an amendment um, to add that bullet point that's on the Kondrashevsky, um potential amendment um, about no food or beverages may be served or consumed outside the venue, um, given the concerns that have been raised um, on multiple occasions around um, external um, activity and impact on the neighbours. Anything further, Councillor Hallett? No? Okay. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Um, just a question through you. Uh, the, it doesn't directly relate to the amendment, but it may be more so to the substantive, but the principle's the same. The, there's been some concern about uh, uh, compliance, noise monitoring, uh, complaints procedures, etc. So can we just get some clarity from the city how you would see that evolving? So, for example, if uh, uh, an event is held uh, and there's a call from... Uh, call to rangers if you're coming to work in the morning and you're told there was an issue last night at whatever hour it may be or the neighbours were um, you know, kept awake, whatever. What, what is open? What would be the city's procedure? Uh, noise monitoring equipment, if that's requested, or is that to be supplied at our expense? Those sorts of things. Can we just get some clarity around how compliance is intended to be maintained? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, in terms of the compliance regime, uh, the noise, it depends on where the noise is emanating from. If the noise is from the venue itself, from performances, um, which I am not of the view that it would be based on the acoustic report, um, then I guess uh, there could be some noise monitoring um, equipment installed by the city um, to address such concerns if they were raised. Now, if the noise is generated from patrons coming and going from the venue, that is really uh, challenging in terms of noise monitoring equipment um, and the noise regulations aren't um, set up to deal with such concerns, um, uh, in, I guess, in the best way to address those. Now, that's probably more so a management issue, and that is what um, uh, administration has outlined in its report. That is probably the greatest challenge in terms of this proposal. Um, there is a patron um, entry and exit management plan uh, in a way to uh, mitigate that particular issue, but ultimately, if noise is made by people coming and going from the venue, much more challenging. So though the rangers could attend the site, um, I guess it's probably more so uh, how do you deal with a crowd, potentially up to 100 people at 10pm at night, um, spilling onto the street and directing them in the right um, direction, I guess, to disperse. Uh, that is, again, addressed through the patron management plan. So there's intended to be staff that will guide um, attendees to and, and from the venue and to their seat and such, but uh, ultimately it is heavily reliant on that management plan being um, uh, complied with. And I guess that is the reason why um, administration is of the view that a, a time-limited approval is appropriate, um, because potentially there could be, um, could be impacts off-site for the adjoining properties. But just for clarity, in the event that that was an issue that was not being managed through the management plan, under the proposed amendment, somewhere between six and nine months, the city, it would be at the city's disposal to be able to limit the number of patrons or say, sorry, evening performances are no longer allowed or something of that nature. So that those mechanisms are available to the city given that the manage, venue management plan is to be reviewed and agreed by the city after six months only, even though it's an 18 month approval. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Um, and from a practical sense, I think, uh, 
quite early on in terms of after the f probably the first event, you will note whether uh, it is being managed appropriately and there will be some key learnings. If there are some concerns raised, um, those will be raised with the applicant um, to address because ultimately the applicant um, has a vested interest to ensure that it's being um, conducted in the best way possible to minimise disruption to the adjoining property. So we work together with the applicant to address that if any issues arose. Can I just ask a follow-up question on that? I'm a little bit confused if you're saying that we can review the management plan and alter the number of patrons and what evening events happen given that the planning conditions give the range of hours and the planning and the patron numbers. How could the venue management plan override the planning conditions? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so we're referring to uh, amendment from Councillor Toppleberg 3.3, if I'm correct. Uh, ultimately, that would not be able to um, increase the number of patrons on site, um, on site, sorry, uh, because that's uh, confirmed by virtue of condition 2.5 as, as um, contained in that amendment, but it could limit that um, based on compliance with or ensuring that it doesn't uh, create any particular issues. So it won't be able to override in the sense of increasing the intensity or the scale of the development, but it absolutely could reduce it to ensure that um, it doesn't uh, detrimentally impact the adjoining property. So just to be very clear, the amendment says that um, there is a maximum occupancy of 100 persons, which also depends on building code compliance, but if that is satisfied, um, but there are complaints about entering and exiting causing a disturbance, for example, are you saying that you can then tweak the venue management plan to reduce that number from 100, even though the planning condition states that there could be a maximum of 100 people and the building code compliance is in place. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, yes, that condition that sets out a maximum of 100 persons in condition 2.5 simply um, uh, provides that cap, um, but ultimately uh, the applicant is still required to comply with all of the other terms of that approval, including um, the venue management plan. Uh, and if it's uh, in the scenario where it would result in um, concerns, uh, then ultimately they would need to reduce the number of persons and that would be available to the city to work through with the applicant. I find that interesting. <laughs> Are you absolutely certain that, that through the venue management plan you could, for example, say there has been a noise disturbance but at, ten, at the 10 o'clock exit, for example, and under the venue management plan we now seek to reduce the hour on, say, Saturday from 10 to 8 p.m. under the ven venue management plan, even though there's a 10 p.m. finish time under the, condition, the planning conditions. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, that would be the approach um, on the basis that uh, the off-site impacts need to be addressed through the venue management plan and if it's viewed that there's a particular session um, in the example that you gave in terms of finishing time, uh, if that was creating um, those impacts then that would be available to the city to work with the applicant to address that particular concern which may mean reducing um, the, the uh, number of patrons or the operating hours or whatever it might be for that to address that particular issue. Councillors. Councillor Gonczewski. Um, look, I'll just speak briefly on this one. Um, I think that given that the amendment is quite, um, covers quite a lot of the issues that I had with this application, um, I think look, ultimately no one is questioning that the, this is a unique facility that has been both um, purpose-built from a technical perspective but has also been purposefully built to give musicians and visitors a unique and uniquely Australian aesthetic experience during performances. I can personally see why both the venue and the proposal has garnered support from the um, artistic and the music loving community and why it has been pursued by the applicant. However, what we're considering today is whether a portion of this residential property in an R50 residential area should be permitted to operate in a commercial manner 
whether this proposed use is compatible and complementary to the residential properties that surround it, and if so, what, whether the conditions on operation and management are successfully able to address the risks associated with the introduction of the commercial use in the residential area. Um, I've been on council for four years, and in that time we've assessed a number of change of use application in, applications in residential areas, and I believe that the city has demonstrated um, a track record, track record of being considerate of residential amenity. We've re refused an application in North Perth for a dental practice, we've re refused short-term accommodation on Moyer Street, and we've refused a cafe and restaurant on Chelmsford Road um, in close proximity to a town centre where there were concerns about noise and amenity impacts on surrounding neighbours. So whilst each application is assessed on its merits, this history weighs on my mind when we're making this decision. Um, however, I've considered a few things. One of which is that the residential use of the premises is maintained. The primary interface with the street is still a residential home with the applicant, a long-term resident, residing on site. An agreed management plan will cover issues such as entrance and egress of patrons and parking management. The soundproofing of the venue so it can function effectively as a recording studio will mitigate the impact of performance noise on surrounding neighbours. And the primary noise impact will likely be for a reasonably short period of time when patrons leave the venue at the end of performances. So with that in mind, I want to support a trial of this venture, but this is a residential area and I'm protective of that. So I believe that the time-limited approval with strong conditions to protect residential amenity is required to ensure that the implementation of this new use can be considered complementary and compatible to the residential area and also give it a reasonable shot of being something that can be supported in the long term. So I'm supportive of this amendment overall, but we'll consider a little further tweaking in terms of restrictions on patron numbers, food service and hours of operations when we return to the substantive motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, I think I'm the only one that hasn't spoken to the amendment now. Um, look, I do just want to go through some of the issues because um, we are dealing with a planning matter and the critical issue really that we're considering is land use. It is a residential zoning as Councillor Gondoshevsky has referred and we do need to assess whether we think this is a compatible use and what the impacts on residential amenity may be and how we can seek to mitigate those. Um, in relation to the um, issues raised about the uh, the development of the um, studio itself, I do just wish to raise it in the report. It does state that retrospective approval was granted last year, so there is no non-compliance outstanding. Um, this has obviously garnered a huge amount of support for this proposal from the arts and music community. We've heard from musicians from um, throughout Perth metropolitan area, we've heard from technicians, we've heard from people who are music aficionados and who, people who just generally enjoy um, you know, the world-class facility that is on offer. Um, it is something that we, I think most of us on council have actually had a site visit and we have experienced for ourselves that this is incredibly beautiful, incredibly well crafted. Um, it is very desirable for the arts industry and I take the comments this evening, they would know better than me that it's world class. Um, we do have a lot of support um, in terms of when this was advertised, the official submissions that came in, 120, 93 were in support and I understand the petition that the applicant has provided is now in excess of 320. However, we do need to seriously consider adjoining residences. They do require specific consideration as they are potentially receiving the greatest impact, especially noise. And when we look at the original submissions received, there were 24 objections within 100 metres. Um, we had, re had received advice that all directly adjoining neighbours object. I did meet with um, Mr Morris Ryan yesterday, but I do note that his comments this evening, while he still is raising concerns about the hours of use, he seems to have shifted in that he recognises that we are seeking to trial this with a time-limited period. And I understood his comments this evening were a bit more positive than they were yesterday when I met with him at his home, um, and that I think that that 
when we met, we talked about the fact that we were looking at a time limited approval. So in relation to the, um, when we look at these issues, we do need to balance opening up this absolutely unique opportunity here in in Perth and in Vincent and understanding what those impacts may be and, and whether this can be compatible. Is it suitable and appropriate? Um, when I've looked at this, I have taken note that the venue can comply with the noise regulations during performances. Um, we are looking at monthly events at limited times. Um, we have, as I've mentioned, um, we do have the issue of the coming and going and Council Loden started off with this point and I think this is the issue about how we manage that potential disturbance when, when guests are coming and going from the studio. Once they're inside, I don't think we have anything to worry about. It is literally short bursts of coming and going and I think that that is why it's going to be critical to see how this is managed um, going forward. So... Um, so I am in support of providing a time-limited opportunity to test this. It is, um, it is when we're looking at these matters, we do need to have regard to the circumstances and merits of each case, and we are dealing with unique circumstance here. So I am supportive of um, a time-limited approach to see whether we can actually get this working, because I, I, I believe it to be something that is greatly beneficial to um, to the broader community and we need to see whether that can be balanced against the needs of the immediate residences. It is untested um, and this gives us the opportunity to test it. I think the management plan is good and strong and I think that um, it, the use really just needs to be tested out because we don't have all the answers before us until we actually see how this operates. Some observations um, when dealing with planning matters often people fear what is going to happen and the level of noise and I think that this is, an, this is a perfect example of where we need to see if that actually does come to fruition. So um, I'm probably similar to Councillor Gonsaszewski in that I'm supportive of the amendment but I do have a few concerns. I originally was thinking that probably 9 to 12 months could be a, a viable time to test this, um, test this out. I'm sort of uh, just still considering that and also um, in terms of the actual events happening outside of musical performance um, I am really querying whether we do need to have activity on a Sunday given that this is a residential area. Um, I think the performance every every month on the Sunday is one thing but to have 9am to 7pm Monday to Sunday to have um, other activities happening in a residential area is something that we do need to consider a little bit more closely. So I will support this amendment but I'll be interested to see if any further tweaks do come forward. Is there any further comment? I think everyone has spoken on the amendment, so I'm going to put it. All those in favour? I declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Gondoshevsky. I'm just going to do these one at a time. Um, can I please put forward an amendment um, under item 3.1 to include an additional dot point to say no food or beverages may be served or consumed outside the venue. Seconded, Councillor Hallett. I'm, um, there's obviously other approvals in place that um, would be applicable if food or beverage was to be served. I think that you know, in a contemporary music space there um, is often some food and beverage served. Um, and so, again, I think this is more around making sure that any noise um, impacts that are felt are um, contained within the venue um, rather than um, pushed out into the area that is um, not currently subject to this application. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. I'm pretty agnostic about um, food and beverage consumption inside the venue. Um, I suspect hydration is probably an important thing, um, but in terms of outside um, open air um, and encouraging people to loiter and mingle out there is probably not what we want. Councillors, Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Coll, I have a question. I'm supportive of the intent of this amendment. Um, I'm just wondering, given that there's an interface between this venue and the residential home, it, it, does that create a problem um, for, for example, the applicant enjoying a barbecue in their own courtyard? And I'm, I know that's not the intent, so I'm just wondering, does that need to be more specifically worded so perhaps no food or beverages may be served or consumed 
served to or consumed by patrons outside the venue. I, it, it might be semantic. I would be amenable to that clarification being included in the original, but I know I'm not allowed to amend an amendment. Is I'm going to take that. That's fine. Um, would you would you be happy with that that technical change to the amendment? Yes, we've got it. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Proceed. Any comments on the amendment, Councillor Murphy? I don't. I don't really support the amendment. I think that the venue management plan um, would cover any issues. Uh, with noise, um, I think that uh, you know this is a trial, um, and I think that these things should be trialled <laughs> basically and see what happens. Um, <laughs> and I think us predetermining certain things may or may not be happening is um, too preemptive. So I won't be supporting the amendment. Councillors, thank you. Uh, where we just for clarity, where we say outside the venue, does that mean because there is sort of a courtyard area that is somewhat open and exposed? Does outside the venue mean outside of where the musical performances are to take place, or does outside of the venue mean the portion of the land which is set aside as studio, which includes the courtyard? Or can we just get some clarity as to what actually outside the venue refers to? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, the venue reference uh, is to the building itself uh, where the music uh, musical performances are being held. So the music studio itself. Okay, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I understand Councillor Murphy's assessment, but ultimately pretty much the only place where you could consume outside of the venue uh, is either facing one residence or in the driveway, which is adjacent to two bedrooms, uh, which I don't think it's a necessary part. I mean, the, the applicant last week was prepared to accept a condition of no food or beverages at all, so I think that allowing them in the venue is uh, probably uh, good enough, and if they want to seek to amend that at a later date, if they, can, if they feel they need to, that's something that can be dealt with separately, but uh, ultimately up to 100 people uh, is one thing up to 100 people potentially being able to have food or beverages in the driveway adjacent to bedrooms at 9.45 at night, I think, is uh, something different. Any further comments on the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Murphy voting against. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Gonczewski. Um Look, I'm going to put forward an amendment to reduce the time limited approval to a period of 12 months from the date of the first musical performance being held. Is there a seconder for the amendment? I'm sorry, I can't second you. Um, there being no seconder, the amendment lapses. <coughs> okay, third one. I'm going to put forward an amendment to item 2.6. Um, to uh, so that outside of the musical performance events, the premises may operate between the hours of 9am and 5pm, Monday to Saturday. Is there a seconder for this amendment? Seconded, Councillor Hallett. Um, this is largely... Um, in line with what has been put forward by the applicant in terms of the types of activities and the general hours of operation that would occur um, outside of the performances. Um, and um, again, I believe it just gives... Um, this is primarily in relation to parking management on the street of the general operation of the facility, where I believe it will in some ways be harder to enforce that um, people don't um, attend the area by, you know, ride share or... Um, or taxi um, and uh, could potentially impact on parking. Um, so I think again this is about actually working out what, where the appropriate level of, um, of what, what the appropriate intensity would be um, and also to provide some reprieve for adjacent residents from um, you know, people coming and going in relation to the, the venue. Um, I think in some ways whilst yes um, residents on Baker Avenue live near a public open space and there's events and activations there. They live near um, 
you know, um, an entertainment district. In some ways, I do think we, we need to be careful in these instances to, um, you know, be extra protective of the remaining residential quiet enjoyment that occurs in these areas because... Um, uh, we know that um, that that the people that live in in these um, close proximity to um, events and and active performances um, uh, can certainly gain benefit from it, but it is also it does can detract from the quiet residential enjoyment of their uh, premises. Um, so just to bring this in line with essentially what had been put for the general operations of the facility in the application, Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Happy to support. Um, just bringing it to standard business hours um, for respite for the neighbours. Councillors, Councillor Murphy. Can I just ask a question? <clears throat> if um, the applicant was to have a house party every Sunday afternoon um, for 40 guests uh, as a barbecue um, to have friends around in his backyard, would there be anything prohibiting that from the city's um, perspective? That would include uh, food and BYO beer. Through Mayor Cole, uh, in that scenario, it's associated with people residing there. Now, if there were noise complaints with that ongoing activity, I'm sure that would come to the attention of the rangers. Um, and I guess from that perspective, the rangers could investigate in terms of a nuisance and raise that as they occur, but ultimately um, slightly different scenario because this is a, a use that is promoting that type of activity. So um, I guess there's uh, the scenario that you've given. It may be an unlikely one, uh, but ultimately the rangers would investigate such um, complaints if they came to the city's attention. Sorry, just to follow up to that. So if, um, if there was to be a barbecue... Uh, without beer and um, uh, music in a confined space, then they could potentially do that every day of the week unless there was a complaint against made against that. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, my response remains the same. Ultimately, it's associated with the single house, so... Uh, Yes, it would be entitled. The landowners and the occupants would be entitled to have a party, um, ongoing parties, and again, the city would deal with any uh, nuisance or concerns raised with that. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Look. Yeah, I don't support this um, amendment. Um, I think that again, this is a trial. That there's a venue management plan. There's certain. Um, procedures that the city would engage in if there was a complaint. Um, I don't like the idea of restricting masterclasses, educational sessions, sound and film recording um, in a um, world-class venue um, out of fear of what may or may not be. That, that's my view, um, but I respect where you're coming from with that. Um, so, no, I won't support the amendment, though. Councillors? Look, I'm just going to come back to land use. I wholeheartedly support the trial of this um, and hoping that it can work and that it can be a great success. Um, but we are dealing with an R50 residential area. This is a commercial operation, whether it, whatever type of facility it is, it is commercial. It's similar to when we're dealing with short-term accommodation. We have to deal with the land use issue and um, to approve um, hours outside of standard office operating hours, which is already for a commercial operation, um, go, to go beyond that in a residential use um, is, is for me, um, problematic. Um, for me, the main, the main event here is to get the concert club up and running, and this is, this is secondary to that, and that those operations should not exceed what are already standard commercial hours when we're dealing with a residential um, zoning. Um, so it's really just about trying to get the right balance and trying to offer residents living in the um, immediate proximity, those adjoining neighbours, um, some reprieve that they know that these activities aren't going to be happening seven days a week for hours that would exceed standard um, business hours. Any further comment on the amendment, 
Okay, I'll put it, all those in favour, all those against. I declare it carried with Councillor Toppelberg and Councillor Murphy voting against. We're back to the substantive. There being no further comment, I'll put the substantive motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Thanks everyone for coming in from near and far. We wish you all the success with it, Nunzio. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. That takes us to item 9.2, number 48 and 50, Cow Street, West Perth, multiple dwelling amendment to approved. Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor Cole. So the, um, just a question. The, uh, the, sorry, just looking for my, the changing to the planning framework um, that's mentioned in the report on page 143 uh, talks about the state planning policy, uh, and also talks about the change to LPS2, but there's no change in the zoning or the density coding, but doesn't make reference to the to LPS2 not containing the two clauses in, this, in TPS1, which was clause 20 and 27, which gave a 50% density bonus for retention of a heritage building is in clause 20, and clause 27 uh, specifically, well, effectively said, if you retain a heritage building, anything goes. It pretty much said exactly that. I think it was something like any of the <coughs> any of the scheme requirements can be varied if there is the retention or enhancement of a heritage. I'm just getting building. a demonstration of exiting a concert <laughs> uh, venue out in the hallway. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, so, I guess my question is: was was that considered in the offices? Given that it's not mentioned that those two clauses aren't, it's a pretty significant difference between LPS one or TPS1 and LPS2, that those two clauses didn't exist. So that's the 50% density bonus at Clause 20 and the any uh, requirement of the scheme can be varied is Clause 27. Uh, so were, were they considered? And if so... Oh, actually, I'll, I'll just leave it at that question, I guess, to start with. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, so no, the report doesn't specifically touch on um, the density bonus uh, that may have applied previously under the previous scheme. The reason for that is that um, in terms of what was the deemed to comply standard at the time the previous or the original approval was granted and what is the deemed to comply standard under the current framework, that remains unchanged. So we believe that no, that that discretion had already been applied and no further consideration was required there. I take your point about the density bonus and do note that um, LPS2 doesn't include that provision um, on the basis that the uh, deemed provisions took out those requirements and um, the new state planning policy 7.1 requires the local government to prepare a specific or separate um, heritage policy to introduce those um, variations. So the short answer is no, that wasn't contemplated as part of this, but um, on the basis that we thought that no additional discretion was being sought. Okay, so I, I, for me, I guess that what that then leads to is my consideration of uh, point number two, which is the other test, which is the whether it's likely to receive approval now. Uh, I, I was a decision maker in the original decision, and so I can certainly speak to or understand what my level of, uh, what weight I gave those clauses at the time that the original decision was made, but I can't speak for anybody else. I accept there is a suite of arguments made in, in relation to uh, the design, the building setback, the containment of the bulk to the rear, the fourth storey at Cal Street being in the, within the roof space, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess the, I guess I'll just I'll let the debate go, but just highlight that I think that in terms of the difference in the planning framework, those two clauses being a key part of the argument for the support of the development originally and not being in the current uh, planning scheme or the, the 
uh, local planning strategy, I think, is a significant difference that uh, between in the planning framework that may or may not, and particularly in relation to the density, um, may or may not have, uh, and the overall height which results from it, may or may not have influenced people's decision making. But I'll, now that I've made that comment, I'll allow people to ponder and speak. Thank you, Councillor Lowden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, through the Chair um, to the officer, I just wanted to clarify, um, between the briefing and the meeting, we had an additional um, attachment, attachment 11, included into the report, which is the sustainable environment assessment, I think, and I've lost my words there, anyway, um, which uh, speaks to the acceptable outcomes around energy efficiency, and I understand that the officers didn't have the opportunity to update the report in terms of providing a response. So I was wondering if you could just provide a response to um, how uh, the design meets A4.15.1A and B. Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole. So as mentioned um, last week, under the new framework, the uh, development is required to meet the element objective and that can be done through the acceptable outcomes um, and that can be a combination of things. In this instance, uh, they have identified through the sustainability report, which we only received after the briefing, that they are able to achieve an average NATHERS rating of 6.7 across the development and a minimum of five um, NATHERS star rating for uh, majority for a minimum number of apartments. So that satisfies um, one part of the acceptable outcomes. In addition, they have also identified that they will have electric hot water systems that are instant rather than stored, which satisfies um, part B and is specifically listed in the design guidance as being a significant energy efficiency initiative that can be incorporated into developments. So with the combination of those two elements, uh, administration believes that that satisfies the element objective of energy efficiency requirements. Thank you. And just on that, the first part of that around the neighbours requirements, my understanding is that the average needs to be 0.5 above 6, so have an average of 6.7, but then individual dwellings also need to be um, above the minimum standard by 0.5, the minimum standard being five, so they would all need to be at a minimum of 5.5, is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole. So that's only to meet the acceptable outcome. So the BCA states that um, they need to obtain a six star average across the development and each individual unit needs to meet a minimum of five stars, which their assessment identifies that they have. It's only for the acceptable outcomes of um, State Planning Policy 7.1 that it says that you would need to exceed the minimum NATHERS to meet that acceptable outcome. So it's our view that they meet the BCA requirements of 6 uh, 0.7 average across the site and a minimum of five for the units, plus they have instantaneous um, hot water systems that is considered a significant energy efficiency initiative. So the combination of those two are considered to meet the element objective. But it's only if they wanted to um, apply 4.15.1B, uh, which says exceeds the minimum NATHERS, as being their acceptable outcome. So effectively, that would be a deem to comply. They haven't demonstrated that, um, and therefore they're seeking discretion of uh, against the element objective. So what they've been able to demonstrate is that they meet the BCA requirement of an average of six across the site by obtaining 6.7 and meeting the minimum NATHERS rating, but they haven't been able to exceed that. And that's where they're seeking discretion. And that's where it's up to council to determine if that's acceptable or not. And the um, the report that's been provided that was written back in 2016, that's uh, incorporated into the design or that's proposed to be incorporated into design and is there a condition required for that? 
Through you, Mayor Cole. So the report identifies a number of construction methodologies that would need to be implemented in the uh, or identified through the construction drawings for the building permit. So for the purpose of the development application, they haven't shown those um, materials in there because they largely relate to construction elements. So when they get to the building permit stage, they'll need to have identified those on the construction drawings to satisfy the uh, energy report that they've provided. To ensure that that is implemented, uh, we recommend the implementation of a new condition 10 uh, that says all measures as identified in the environmentally sustainable report prepared by Wood and Grieve engineers dated 22nd of August 2016 to be implemented during construction of the development to the satisfaction of the city. And that's available on the screen now, along with an associated advice note to ensure that that is anything that is required out of that is implemented and maintained. Can I move that amendment, please? Do you... um, can I have a se no, Is there a seconder for the amendment? Councillor Hallett is seconding. Um, I guess... Uh, I think it's important that we hold um, the, this development accountable to what it needs to achieve in terms of the neighbours uh, rating. Um, the, the goalposts have shifted since this original uh, thing by increasing the standard by 0.5 and there is a number of recommendations in, including glazing and in, uh, insulation associated with the development um, which is important to achieve from an environmental point of view but it's also about making these livable as, as livable as possible as well. Um, Homes that are well insulated, that have good glazing, are more are nicer places to live. That's part of the reason for including these requirements in there. Thank you. Okay. Nothing to... Sp no? Okay. Councillors, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Okay. I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. I'm happy to support the um, officer recommendation with the amendment included. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the developments that are sitting down around the five star rating. Um, it's rated on a ten star scale, so this is halfway there. Um, I don't exactly know how this is, is done, but um, I imagine a cardboard box would be zero and the best department in the world would be ten, and so this is halfway between the two, potentially. Um, and I think there's probably an opportunity for us to... Um, to uh, to drive this further. The state government's shifted the goalposts and we should be enforcing this as much as possible. It is a climate emergency after all, right, Councillor Toppelberg? Um, <laughs> I'll go back to my bunker. Um, inclusion of one significant energy efficiency initiative, I'm not convinced that an instantaneous uh, gas hot water system would count. I, obviously it's listed here, but uh, that seems peculiar to me. Um, I d you don't typically see large uh, storage systems these days because they take up a lot of space. It's much more efficient to have um, an instantaneous gas system. Yes, they're more efficient, but there's a lot further you can go in that space around um, inclusion of heat pumps or solar hot water systems and so forth, and so it'd be good to see those types of things included in future. Um, but we are where we are. Councillor Gonshevsky. I don't know if I'm supporting this. I just might not put my hand up. I think just in terms of uh, um, the... I note that there was no changes to the zoning or density in the change of LPS. We've had the... Um, we've had changes in state planning policy. And I'm... Although the DRP have provided some positive commentary and, and that landscaping issues have been addressed, I, I still feel that I'm, I'm not sure that this is likely to receive approval now in relation, particularly in relation to the side and rear setbacks and the street setback. I'm, I'm challenged by this in a way that I'm not usually challenged by this extension of time. So um, I just thought I'd put that out there. Councillor Hallett. Just a question from the um, public gallery related to, um, is there a scope that we could put a condition that undeveloped land is used for car parking for contractors during the development? 
through you, Mayor Cole, the existing approval has a condition for the construction management plan, and that would generally be the um, avenue that we would explore for car parking for contractors. So there's a requirement in there um, for the applicant to identify where their staff would be parking during construction, and that's the ideal location. I, that will likely be where they have their set down for the materials during construction and where the staff park. So I believe it's already covered. Councillors, any further comments? Okay, I'll put the application. All those in favour? All those against? Ooh, declare, declare it lost. <laughs> we need reasons for refusal. Changes to the planning framework that mean it Change. would be unlikely to receive approval if it were presented now? Yep. Specifically, removal of clause 20 and 20, or clause 20 and 27 of town planning scheme one, no longer applying. Building height, setbacks, or well, street setbacks and side setbacks. Um, I think that we'll probably be best placed to um, have an have a alternate decision that is a deferral, so that we can actually have time to work through the reasons for refusal. No, but the decision could be the alternate decision could be that we defer consideration until we take into further consideration these factors. Yep. Yes. Yep. So can we do that, that we, um, that the council, its decision is to defer consideration of the planning item until further assessment undertaken to consider the changes to the planning, planning framework and the likelihood of this meeting um, the requirements of the current plan, planning framework, including the removal of clause 20 and 27 of the um, planning scheme, now that we are under local planning scheme two. Thank you. Moved, seconded, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, it being a deferral motion, there being no debate. Do you wish, before we actually move it, do you want to actually see the... I wouldn't say the planning item. It should be the first consideration of the time extension application. Um, I think the final no, sentence... No, so the, the, the like, likelihood of, uh, of, of the development being approved in light of the removal of clause, in light of... The removal. Well, of isn't it just in light of um, the, of, in light of um, t local planning scheme two, not having any provisions similar to clause twenty and twenty seven of town planning scheme one.
Um, is the mover and seconder satisfied with that form of words? Okay. It's um, this being a deferral motion. There is no um, further debate, so I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Do you need anything more from us or can we move on? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, we have one final item this evening which has um, been raised because we have a council member with a financial interest. So that's 11.4, which is the authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st of September to 23rd of September 2019. Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Loden. I will speak to it very briefly, only to say that I did send through some questions to the CEO, which I uh, will await the answers, but just in relation to the um, uh, payments for, so there is, we've presumably engaged a marketing firm uh, to conduct some work at Betty Park Leisure Centre, and just uh, um, those questions have been asked to the CEO and make further comment, I suppose, internally, but uh, what was highlighted to me was that the firm is not based within the city of Vincent, so just seeking uh, reasons why we didn't uh, go to a, a local provider and what extra special service we're being provided by a non-city of Vincent marketing company extraordinaire. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the engagement is not for marketing per se, it is for um, website search enhancement. So um, it's a digital technology, um, usually with a partner with, with Google, um, and we weren't aware of any um, local providers. We did go out for quotes for um, su suitable um, firms that could provide the service, and we can provide more details on, on that contract um, offline. Councillor Doppelberg, do you have any further questions? Councillor Loden? Anyone wish to comment? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? I declare it carried. If we could please have Councillor Murphy back in the room. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Some of them are child sized. <laughs> just, act, just act normal. Oh, you've got one too. <laughs> we have concluded the council meeting business for this evening, so I declare the meeting close at um, 10 minutes to 10. Thank you.